Okay, uh, we're looking at the June 2011 BY1 paper, and uh, this is question number four. Uh, it's uh, quite a chunky question. It's worth uh, 12 marks uh, in total, uh, and it's all to do with enzymes. Okay, um, so the, uh, the examiner there is telling you about a little experiment involving the enzyme catalase. All right, now catalase is an enzyme you should be familiar with. Uh, you do need to know that its substrate, look, is hydrogen peroxide, okay, and the products um, of the reaction there would be oxygen and water, okay. Um, you may even do or use catalase in your BY3 uh, practical. Uh, I know it is quite a common uh, experiment to do for BY3. All right, but that's that's up to your teachers, really. But uh, you may very well use it uh, in class. Um, so what this experiment is about is about um, measuring the volume of oxygen given off uh, in a certain time. All right. So as the examiner is telling you, uh, you're measuring oxygen every 20 seconds. All right. Because remember, oxygen is one of the products um of this uh, enzyme catalase okay uh, just in passing there's actually an, a whole range of ways uh, to measure the oxygen given off okay uh, but in this case they're just measuring uh, the volume of it okay um right let's um let's move down and uh, have a look at this graph for a moment I just want to go through uh, the the axes with you. So if I scroll down to the x-axis, uh, this is uh, time. Okay, please make a note of the units. All right. In this case, the examiner has decided uh, to use seconds, uh, and I think um, more often than not, really, for your biology exam, uh, if you have a graph with time, it'll probably be in seconds. But that 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 doesn't matter. You still need to check and make sure what uh, units are being used. OK, so um, just to give you some indication of the scale, basically one large square is equal to 20 seconds. OK, uh, that means because there's five, sorry, 10 small squares within one big square. So I just highlight one big square for you. OK, whoops. Um, within that large square, there are f uh, 10 smaller squares. OK, uh, so as I've said in previous videos, you need to know what value one small square is. All right. So again, this is pretty straight, straightforward maths. Uh, basically, one small square is equal to um, two seconds. OK, so you need to you need to know what one small square is for um, for the calculation you're going to do later. OK, um, OK, so that's the X axis. Then uh, the Y axis is uh, volume of oxygen in centimeters cubed. OK, now in this case, uh, let's choose this large square. One large square is equal to uh, two centimeters cubed. Okay, so for example, there it goes from six up to eight for one large square, and that means in this instance then that one small square is actually equal to 0.2 of a centimeter cubed. All right, so if you were to count uh, from uh, six centimeters cubed then up you would hopefully see that eventually you'll get to seven as listed on the y-axis. So each small square is equal to 0.2 uh, of a centimeter cubed. OK, uh, and again, you need to be able to do that for the y-axis for um, the, the question that uh, follows now in a second. All right, then. So uh, there's the graph. Um, the only other thing I want to mention is this line here, uh, labelled X. This um, this line the examiner has drawn is the first time he's ever done it here. I've never, this is the first time I've seen a question like this. Um, he does make reference to that line later on, uh, so I will 
tackle that at the appropriate point okay but lastly then just to show you that the um, the curve on the graph there um, is what we're interested in for the first question really that's um, the data that's been collected and plotted uh, on the graph okay uh, so let's go down to part A then. It, uh, it does involve a calculation, as I've said. Um, the rate of reaction can be calculated using the formula volume of oxygen collected divided by time taken to collect. Okay. Now, you do need to know how to calculate rate. Hopefully you've covered it in class. I've covered it in my notes and I will uh, or have covered it in a video tutorial as well. And basically, to calculate rate, uh, you do need to divide uh, a value by time, okay? Uh, in this case, we're looking at the volume of oxygen collected in a given time, okay? Um, so, like I say, I'll go into that equation in more detail in, a, in another video tutorial. So, you're asked now to calculate the rate in centimetres cubed uh, per minute, for the first 30 seconds so let's just highlight this unit here the examiner wants you to quote your answer using centimeters cubed per minute if you don't quote it in those units you will lose marks okay um, so let's go back up to the graph note that the graph has a time scale in seconds okay but you need to quote your answer in minutes. All right, so uh, there are a number of ways of doing that, which I'll uh, explain uh, in a minute. But basically, there's, there's a unit conversion that you have to do because the graph is in seconds and you are told to quote your answer per minute. All right, so I will show you uh, two ways of doing that uh, conversion. All right. Um, so we're only interested in the rate in the first 30 seconds, all right? So we need to find 30 seconds on the X scale, all right? I've told you about finding the value of uh, one small square. Uh, so all we need to do is to draw a line, uh, two lines on the graph, okay? So I will find 30 seconds, uh, which is there. Draw a line up to the curve. OK, now I've slightly overshot the curve, but that doesn't matter because I need to line up there and draw a line across. OK, try and do it as accurately as you can. OK, you need to use a very sharp pencil for this uh, and a ruler. Don't use a pen because if you make a mistake, you really are going to be in trouble because you will potentially then not be able to accurately uh, read off uh, the graph. OK, so what I'm interested in is actually the volume of oxygen. OK, so hopefully you can see straight away that the volume of oxygen is actually 5.8. All right. Um, so we've got our volume of oxygen. So how do we calculate this rate? Now, I want to pull up a uh, picture. All right. I've written out um, two ways to do this calculation. I want to briefly um, explain it. OK. Uh, but again, this, this, the, these calculations have been um, tackled in a uh, more detailed video tutorial. So what I've done in the first uh, case here, point number one, all right, I have put 5.8, which is the volume of oxygen, and I've divided it by 0.5. I've got an answer of 11.6 centimetres cubed per minute. Why have I divided by 0.5? Well, this is a quick way of doing your uh, conversion from seconds to minutes, all right? Basically, 30 seconds is equal to half a minute. And that's why I've put 0.5 there. 0.5 is half a minute, okay? Uh, so that's a pretty neat, quick way of doing it. Uh, if, if, for example, the examiner wants you to, to calculate something in 30 seconds, OK, so that's easy. I've done the uh, the conversion there by putting in half a minute. That's what I've done. I have basically divided 5.8 by half a minute and 0.5 is equal to uh, 0.5 minutes is equal to 30 seconds. 
all right if you follow me okay uh, so that's that's a pretty easy straightforward way of doing it uh, point number two though this is a second way of doing it and to be honest with you I prefer to do it this way I have to admit but maths is a is a, is a funny thing there's lots of ways uh, to do calculations and get the right answer and it's it's a very personal thing in how you actually do the calculation really okay uh, so I prefer to do it by point two so what I've done is I've divided 5.8 by 30 seconds because that's what I've read off the graph okay now that's given me an answer of uh, 0 0.19333 recurring all right so you get all the, the rest of that value will be all threes now um, if you were to quote that answer in your exam it would be marked wrong all right that is not the right answer based on the units that the examiner wants you to use all right so basically that answer is in seconds it's volume of oxygen in seconds okay now I want to convert that to minutes as you can see there so all you do is simply multiply your answer by 60 because there are uh, 60 seconds in a minute and you get the same answer look 11.6 centimeters cubed per minute two ways to get the same thing um, you decide which one you want to use all right but be aware you have to very often convert uh, from seconds to minutes okay um, and uh, I've heard statements from uh, from my students or oh, the examiners trying to trick us it's absolute nonsense the examiner is not trying to trick you all right you need to be um, concentrating in an exam it's an exam you're there to be examined okay um, and this is what a levels is all about all right so there's no trickery involved here all right um, it's all to it's all up to you uh, to read the question properly uh, and to give the right answer okay so I hope that little uh, calculation there uh, helped you all right if I uh, take that away then uh, you obviously now need to write in your answer there you need to show your workings out and make sure you quote the unit when you state your final answer okay uh, so the answer there was 11.6 centimeters cubed per uh, minute all right um so i won't write the answer in there because you've already seen uh, the calculation that i've uh, drawn out for you right moving on to part b this is where we need to look at uh, the line x now i think this is uh, a pretty good question actually so let me read it for you the initial rate is the rate of reaction at the beginning and is the maximum rate okay it is shown by line x and the initial rate is 19 centimeters cubed per minute explain why the initial rate is greater than the rate calculated in a all right so we calculated 11.6 wasn't it so uh, the examiner is telling you that the rate of reaction at the start that's what the initial rate means okay so let's have a look at this line uh, X okay the line is actually going through the origin okay and that line now you don't need to, to, to know how this is calculated but it is easy to calculate really but basically that line there uh, will give you the rate of reaction right at the very very start of this catalyze uh, sorry catalase experiment okay um, and scientists are always interested in the initial rate because that will tell you the maximum rate that that enzyme is working at for any particular experiment okay so that's the most interesting part of the experiment actually so what you can see as you already know 30 seconds into the reaction the rate has dropped considerably it's gone from 19 to 11.6 which is what we calculated in part a all right so why is the initial rate greater 
All right. Now, I know some of my students did not like this question. OK, um, but it does. It's, it's a way of examining you and getting you to think about how enzymes work. Believe it or not, the answer to this question is everything really that you've been taught in class. OK, it's all to do really with the concentration of substrate. All right. Now, the greatest concentration of substrate is always at the very, very start of the reaction. OK, um, so basically, when you have a high concentration of substrate, OK, you have lots and lots and lots of enzyme substrate complexes being formed and hence more product all right now this is why the rate is very rapid at the start because you've got a lot of product being formed in a very very short time period all right and that means the rate is incredibly high right at the start okay now like i say i will will expand on on this this concept in um another video tutorial okay uh, the point of these exam technique uh, videos is just to show you how to get into the question and where the relevant knowledge applies okay uh, so the answer there is quite simply that that at the start you have the maximum concentration of substrate it means that all the active sites are involved in uh, converting or catalyzing that substrate into product and that then gives you the uh, the high rate uh, of reaction okay so uh, I've written my answer in I've said the concentration of substrate is highest at the beginning of the reaction so there will be a maximum number of enzyme substrate complexes being formed all right so that's quite important to mention and so the uh, and so a high volume of oxygen being produced in a short time period okay uh, so that uh, should get you uh, two marks uh, for that part of the question right part C all right we have another graph here okay so let's read out what the examiner is saying the graph below shows the effect of temperature on the activity of an amylase enzyme found in bacteria that live in hot water in volcanic regions. Now, that <coughs> statement is jam-packed full of relevant information you need to be aware of. For a starters, we're now looking at, looking at the effect of temperature on enzyme activity. All right, so you should be accessing uh, the, the information now about how temperature affects enzyme activity. Okay, um, you are told that the enzyme is amylase all right so you need to be aware that it's an amylase enzyme and secondly that it's talking about the enzyme in bacteria all right and lastly you're told that those bacteria live in hot water in volcanic regions okay so instantly then you should be thinking right this is perhaps to do with a thermostable enzyme an enzyme that can tolerate very high temperatures, all right, which do exist. Okay, there are bacteria that live in these hot volcanic vents, and they do have enzymes that are uh, tolerant of very, very high temperatures. Okay, so um, that is a lot of information in that question you need to be picking up on and remembering. All right. So let's uh, let's scroll down and um, look at this graph that the examiner has got here for you. All right, uh, can't quite fit it all in, but basically the x-axis is temperature because that's what the uh, the question is all about is temperature. All right, so let's scroll down so we can see the peak of the graph, uh, and the y-axis then is uh, rate of reaction in arbitrary units. All right. Um, so just looking at that graph, it should look similar. It, it won't look identical at all, uh, but it should look similar to a graph uh, your teacher has maybe drawn or shown you in class, 
where you get the effect of temperature on enzyme activity. And you always have a peak on that graph, don't you? And that peak generally relates to the uh, optimum temperature, generally. Okay, although you could argue whether that is the optimum temperature on this graph, but I'll go into that at a, 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 in a, another video tutorial. All right, so basically that should have the same general pattern as a graph that you've seen before. All right, so don't get put off by the fact that you have these regions here, okay, where uh, the line sort of deviates a little bit, and here and there. Don't worry about that. The overall pattern is, is simply this. As the temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction until you reach the maximum temperature, which is often known as the optimum, and then uh, the uh, rate of reaction decreases after the optimum. That should be something you're familiar with. Right, okay, so that's the graph. Um, the question now, uh, it's worth six marks, all right? It's a lot of marks um, for, for what's known as a short answer, quest, uh, short answer question. All right. Just to put this into some context for you, remember that each paper ends up with a long answer question uh, worth 10 marks. OK, so, you know, you're four marks off your a long answer question. OK, six marks. You're not given a great deal of space to write your answer. OK, so this is a case where you need to be writing uh, concisely uh, and to the point. If you were waffling, uh, by uh, writing your answer here, you're likely to run out of room quickly because there's a lot to say for six marks. All right, so this is a case now where you need to write concisely uh, and to the point. Okay, so what do you have to uh, say then? Uh, using the graph, describe and explain the effect of temperature on the rate of activity of amylase. Okay, fine. Tip for you. Whenever you're asked to describe, okay, whether it's um, a, a table of results or a graph, always quote values, okay? You need to be quoting values from the temperature scale in this instance and the rate of reaction scale, okay? Um, that then will ensure that you get uh, good uh, marks. Now, a little tip for you here. As I've said, you haven't got a lot of room. All right, there's actually quite a lot of detail we could go into in this graph, but because of the space, because of the time constraints, you really uh, can't do it. All right, so basically I want to describe um, the, the graph for you. All right, now all you have to do is this. You can say quite clearly that from 20 degrees C, so that's where the graph starts, all right, so I've quoted now 20 degrees C. From that temperature, the rate of reaction goes from zero. So you can see that at 20, the rate is zero. So the rate of reaction will increase from zero at 20 degrees C to 100. Okay, that's the rate, 100 at... 100 degrees C. Okay, that has quite neatly described the first part of that graph. The rate of reaction increases from 0 to 100 as you increase the temperature from 20 degrees C to 100 degrees C. Okay, and don't forget to quote the units in your answer. Um, some people will argue, well, what about describing that region of the graph where uh, the, uh, the the data points um, uh, deviate off a little bit? Well, you could describe it, but you, you haven't got a lot of room to do that. What I think is best here is just to describe the general pattern uh, of the graph. Okay, And the general pattern at the moment is this. The rate of reaction increases for an increase in temperature. OK. Right. Um, that'll get you um, a mark. But there's also uh, another part of the graph that you can describe. And that's what happens 
at a temperature above 100. Okay, so what you can say is that when the temperature uh, increases further to 130, so it's gone from 100 to 130 degrees, okay, centigrade, the actual um, rate of reaction has dropped from 100 to um, 30, okay? All right, so that rate has dropped quite uh, dramatically uh, over that uh, time period. Uh, okay, um, I've just realized that I've actually read the y-axis scale wrong. Okay, now um, basically uh, the examiner has got uh, 50 there. Okay, um, so it actually, uh, the scale actually goes up in 10. So you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Uh, so the actual uh, drop in rate um, really goes down to um, to 20 there, not 30. Okay, uh, so don't make mistakes like that in an exam. Okay, you do need to be able to read off the, the, the axes uh, accurately. Okay, so uh, uh, from 100 degrees C to 130 degrees C then, the rate of reaction has dropped from 100 uh, down to 20. Okay, um, so that's a basic description there uh, of the graph. Okay, I don't think you need to uh, describe any more than that. Uh, so the rest of the um, answer is all to do with explaining why the rate of reaction increases um, from uh, 20 to 100 degrees and then why it decreases when you further increase the temperature. Okay. Now, um, it's all to do again, because we're looking at temperature, it's all to do with kinetic energy. Okay. And um, the enzyme and the substrate having more kinetic energy, which means the molecules move faster, uh, they collide uh, more successfully, so that means you get more enzyme substrate complex is being formed okay um, you can actually state um, in this case that uh, the optimum temperature is 100 degrees C okay so um, there's the 100 degrees C there uh, that's the optimum temperature because it's the temperature at which the rate of reaction is at its maximum okay so that's there so always remember to talk about the optimum temperature in these types of uh, questions. Okay, um, so we've basically talked about now why the rate of reaction increases. It's all to do with that kinetic energy stuff again. Um, what happens then as you further increase the temperature? Well, basically the temperature is too high. All right, you're actually above the optimum temperature. All right, and that means that the, the, the whole enzyme protein has uh, lost shape. The bonds that maintain the shape of the enzyme have been broken, uh, particularly the hydrogen bonds, okay. Um, that, that, you know, as you increase the kinetic energy of an enzyme, it vibrates so much, so vigorously, that the bonds break. Uh, and basically, the enzyme has become denatured, all right. It's lost its uh, globular, three-dimensional shape. That means the active site has lost its shape, so it's no longer complementary to the substrate. And that means that the enzyme does not work anymore, and that's why the rate uh, has dramatically uh, dropped. So that, that answer there is all to do with the effects of temperature, okay? Um, which, which I think is a pretty reasonable question. Apart from the space that you left, I think you should have a bit more space there, okay? Right, I shall jot that answer in. Okay, so uh, I've typed in an answer there, okay, um, <clears throat> and just, uh, you know, just to, to uh, explain again, uh, there's not a lot of space uh, to write this answer, and uh, I was struggling a little bit myself uh, to get all the uh, the text in, uh, but uh, I got all the, the points in that I wanted to, and uh, this should achieve uh, six marks, okay. Um, so I've started off talking about the rate 
increases from 0 to 100 when the temperature increased from 20 to 100 degrees C. Uh, now I've put the units in for temperature. OK. I've decided not to put the units in for rate because they were arbitrary units. OK. Um, uh, so I just left that out. Uh, I've said as the temperature was increased from 100 to 130 degrees C, the rate fell to 20. Then um, we talk about the higher temperatures, more kinetic energy. Um, it causes the enzyme and the substrate to move faster. And for more enzyme substrate complexes to form. Okay, that's uh, quite uh, important there. Okay. Okay, um, I've then stated that the optimum temperature is 100 degrees C. All right, and then I've started talking about the effects of temperatures above 100. All right, so I've said the kinetic energy is too high, and this causes excessive vibrations in the enzyme that break the hydrogen bonds. All right, this causes the enzyme to be denatured and the active site to change shape. Now, what I would have liked to have put in here, but ran out of space, all right, is to state that the active site is no longer complementary to the substrate, okay, and therefore you can't have uh, enzyme substrate complexes being formed. Uh, but I know that in the mark scheme, they allow denatured uh, for a mark, and actually for a second mark to state that the active site has changed shape. All right, so... Um, uh, we're fine uh, for the marks here. Right, I hope that helped you how to uh, structure this um, question. Okay, and um, the uh, sort of concise nature in which um, I've written uh, the, um, the answers there. Okay, uh, let's scroll down then to the last part. Uh, state the difference between bacterial amylase and an amylase found in humans. Okay, um, this uh, this is worth two marks. Okay, and um, what what hopefully you do know, and it is something I've put in my notes, is uh, uh, examples of human enzymes. Okay, and their their optimum temperatures. So amylase is is an enzyme found. Um, uh, in the mouth, and uh, there is an amylase actually found in uh, the duodenum as well. Um, but all human enzymes really have an optimum temperature of around 37 uh, degrees C. Um, it's probably a bit higher than that, actually. Um, but so, so this this uh, this question now, you can bring in the fact that there's different optimum temperatures. You, you, you know the optimum temperature of the bacterial amylase. It's on the graph. It's 100 degrees C. Uh, so you can make a comparison then that uh, bacterial amylase has an optimum of 100 degrees C and human amylase has an optimum of 37 degrees C. Okay. Um, so that would actually get you two marks, stating that there are two different optimum temperatures. OK, and then actually state in the values of those optimum temperatures. OK, um, you could actually then, you know, for, for, a, for an optional mark there, another potential uh, answer is to state that the human amylase denatures at lower temperatures. OK, um, a lot lower than, than 100, the, the human amylase will denature. So that could have been another potential answer that you could have written in there. OK, there you go. I've decided to say the enzymes have different optimum temperatures. Uh, the bacterial amylase is 100 degrees C and the human amylase is 37 uh, degrees C. Right, so that's the end of uh, question four. Uh, quite uh, quite involved, that question. OK, uh, 12 marks, it's worth. So let's have a little look at uh, the marking scheme for you. Uh, part A there, you've got your calculation. OK, I don't know whether you can see those values there. They're a bit pixelated, but basically it's 5.8 divided by 0 0.5. OK, uh, but the examiner will also allow, look, in brackets, the other way I did it was 5.8 divided by 30 seconds times 60. OK, so that's the calculation there. Part B was talking about that line X. 
uh, on the graph okay it's just to do with the maximum concentration of substrate at the start okay part c1 there's the um, description and explanation of the graph okay so there's um, all the marking points there uh, for you okay and uh, lastly then uh, part two uh, talking about the different optimum temperatures for the bacterial and human amylase right i uh, i hope that helped you tackle uh, this question and uh, guided you uh, appropriately into the correct responses okay so that's the end of uh, question four